Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Klaus, for having me here and having the possibility to talk about uh, predictors for negative outcome in hip arthroscopy. Uh, I now work in a little, little smaller hospital north of Bern, but all the cases and all the research was uh, performed here at the, at the Inselspital. So we know nowadays that arthroscop uh, arthroscopic treatment of femoral acetabular impingement is successful. We know that the clinical outcome is comparable to open surgery. Uh, there are good review articles that show that when we compare arthroscopy to open surgery or also combined uh, procedures, that it, it's a comparable um, outcome. We have also done a study here in Bern where we have looked on the, on the treatment of CAM impingement between open surgeries and arthroscopic surgeries, and there also we have seen that there is a, basically no significant difference in the two techniques. So the technique is established, and we can achieve also in arthroscopy what we want to achieve. There's a low complication rate with a major complication somewhere around 0.5%. This can be fluid extravasation or it can be nerve injuries. And there's a little bit larger proportion of minor injuries to up to like 4%. This can be, for instance, heterotopic ossification. And it's shown that a reoperation rate in hip arthroscopy is around 4%. In addition, uh, hip arthroscopy allows for a fast rehabilitation. Uh, there are nice groups of, uh, published by Philippon and, uh, and Dom where they had looked on, on, on a fairly large group of uh, professional athletes and seen that there's a 70 to 80% chance of return to their high-level sports within one year. Uh, so is everything good? Uh, then we wouldn't have to have this talk. And we've seen in open surgery that this is the five-year follow-up study uh, from Simon that was published in 2013 on looking on surgical hip dislocation uh, cases, that it's a in significant improve in the clinical outcome of these patients, so from pre-op to post-operative improvement in 93% of all cases, and 51% of all cases of all patients were pain-free. But there's a proportion of about 49% of the cases that have minor residual pain. So in impingement surgery, this is an issue, and we have to have a look at these patients, try to figure out why do we have some that perform very well and why do we have some that maybe perform a little bit less well. There are several reasons why uh, hip arthroscopy cannot be successful, and this can be the post-operative complications, such as uh, uh, adhesions. We have seen adhesions in open surgery, but it also exists in hip arthroscopy. This is a study uh, in uh, a, red, um, a review study from uh, over 1,200 hip arthroscopy cases, and they have seen an adhesion rate of about 4.5%. Uh, um, and it was mostly in the cases where they didn't have a very active circumduction uh, therapy. I think when, now we have, when we put these people early on a rehab protocol where they really circumduct their hips, I think most of these adhesions can be avoided. Another issue are heterotopic ossifications, which in this uh, review of six, over 600 cases was up to 1.8%. And they're so predominantly male patients and uh, much lowered when uh, indomethacin therapy was added to the surgery. So also this is uh, something that, that could be basically resolved. Of course, what we have to always take in mind is do we really have the right diagnosis? When we talk about bad results or bad cases, this is one of my own cases. A 25-year-old female patient with pain in the right hip, she had a positive impingement test and she was a bit crazy. Uh, but I did the images and I thought, well, this is a classic impingement case and this is something that I know how to do. I will treat it with hip arthroscopy, of course. Uh, I had the, the MRIs and I was happy with the indication and I did the surgery and I was really happy with the post-op image. I thought it was a nice shape of the femoral head. And she did better. She had a better range of motion, uh, but she still had groin pain. And first I thought, she's crazy which is always bad. I think once you think the patient's crazy, and that's the reason, you, you, basically it's your fault, because then I had a look again on her MRIs, and I saw this large teratoma that she had uh, in her stomach, which was seen before, and uh, I didn't see it, and the radiologist in the Solenhof didn't see it either, and then once this teratoma was removed, then the patient was happy, and uh, everything was good. So we have bad cases, and then it's our fault, so that's not, not really the problem of the technique. And then, of course, it's the whole issue of should we treat borderline dysplastic patients? And this is this by, from this publication that you probably most of you are aware of. I like it because it's very illustrative in this case of the indication on a hip with a lateral send reg angle of 22 degrees, so it would be borderline dysplastic, uh, index a little bit high with 8%. 8%. 
And she had a subluxating hip, so you see that the, the right hip is subluxating up, and still they performed hip arthroscopy, uh, also because of this labral damage. You see the labrum was on the, on the 12 o'clock position, was stressed, and they did, and then it happened what has to happen. They resected a little bit of the rim, down to 11%, and then within one year, the whole hip degenerated, and uh, of course the total hip had to be implanted. So I'm not talking about all these cases where we probably would do mistakes or probably have the wrong indication. The, the, the meaning of this study was to be to look at the other cases and to see what's the survivorship of our hip arthroscopies that we performed. Uh, we wanted to see whether there were risk factors predicting failure, and we also wanted to see are there any risk factors that would predict revision surgery in all the patients with a hip arthroscopy. We included uh, 64 consecutive uh, patients that me and Martin Beck uh, treated here between 2003 and 2008, and we had to exclude 14 hips. Three was only diagnostic. In 10 cases, we, we debrided the labrum, uh, or we excited it completely. And in one case, there was a failed attempt. It was the beginning of our learning curve, and which is, can really access the joint. So we included 50 patients and 52 hips. There were 39 isolated cam, four isolated pincer, and nine mixed type uh, uh, FII, and this is what we actually did. The treatment was in most of the cases, 75%, we just treated the CAM. In 17%, we uh, just, uh, we did both CAM pincer, and in 8%, we only did the pincer only. The preoperative tennis grade was in 80% uh, no arthritis sign, and in 19% uh, it was a grade one. Mean follow-up was six years, and we lost two patients to follow up. One, uh, we, we could uh, contact one of them, and he didn't want to participate. We called him many times, and he just refused. And one, we didn't find this is a little bit of a problem in the Swiss system, that they will can just vanish uh, somewhere in, in our social security system. The results, we had 92% uh, of hips preserved at the last follow-up. We had subsequent surgery in 17%. And this surgery was done in six cases with arthroscopy and six cases with surgical dislocation. And it was a bit similar. In one, we did the offset each in one rim trimming and in four cases combined. And in the surgical dislocation group, we did two combined surgery. The conversion to total hip in this time period was 4% two cases. One case was after six years, and one uh, case was eight years uh, after hip arthroscopy. So uh, having a look at the progression of the tennis was in 10% uh, in five patients. There was a worsening of the, of the arthritis. And we had a good to excellent uh, clinical result in the Merle Dobinia score in almost 90% of the cases. So this is an example of a, <clears throat> of a good case. Oh, there's one image missing, excuse me. So this was the pre-op, uh, basically a cam-type impingement with a large alpha angle. These were the cases that we selected when we uh, uh, began with the surgery. And then you see the five-month and the seven-year post-op, and the patient did very good, and she had no symptoms and was happy. Uh, this is another case, uh, the seven-year, no, excuse me. So this, you see the lateral view here. It was a mistake. So you see the, the post-op, the correction of this, of this person. So looking at the results, the survivorship at five years was 100%, and at six years, uh, the survival was 95%. And the risk factors for uh, the endpoints, uh, total hip progression of osteoarthritis or a bad Merle Dobinia score, were uh, preoperative tonus above one, grade one, or uh, male population. Now, looking at the risk factors for revision, we had a look on the patient demographics. With obese patient um, was slightly uh, indicative for revisions. Age didn't matter. And when we had a look at the pre-op hip morphology, this was an important factor. With almost all uh, the, the factors, such as uh, uh, demonstrating pincer impingement or pistol grip, uh, and also uh, uh, extrusion index or a, a low acetabular index were predictive for revisions, whereas the preoperative alpha angle was not a predictor. Looking at the operative uh, intervention, so whatever we did with the labrum, was it a refixation, was it a debridement, or was it a resection, was not a predictor for revision. And we had it in the case discussion just now what we should do about the labrum. So we've seen in the whole group this didn't really matter whether or not we had to revise the patients. The post-op correction was important, looking at the pistol grip. And very interesting, the uh, alpha angle didn't really, was not a predictor for revision. And I'll come to this a little bit later. This is a case where we had to do a revision. Uh, you see the preoperative was a very big uh, cam there, 
And you see on the post-operative image that the cam was not resected, so we had problems in the beginning, really reaching all the way lateral, and then this, came, uh, this person remained symptomatic. So one year post-operative, we did a surgical hip dislocation where we were happy that we would know we could uh, do the technique and, and get the, the bump done, and then she was happy seven years out. Second case here was more than on the on the anti so on the anterior on the three o'clock position was a cam and here again we probably didn't reach all the way to the three o'clock position with the scope and so we again performed surgical hip dislocation where a nice overview resected the remaining bump and then uh, she was good two years out. There are some limitations to this study and uh, I think it's. Uh, demonstrates the learning curve that we had. You see here the percentage of hip scopes via surgical location. So you see we started uh, from 92 all the way up to 98. We basically almost uh, performed surgical hip dislocations and then started to do the scope and the red bar is where uh, the study period was. So this was really in the moment where we started, where we picked up to do the scopes. And this also tended that we had a selection bias in the scope group towards the easy cases you know, where we thought we would be technically able to, to perform the surgery properly. The discussion uh, compared to the study by um, Simon with a follow-up on the surgical hip dislocation group, when you look at the six-year follow-up, it's, it's a similar uh, survival rate that we have. And when we look at the risk factors, actually only the, the preoperative tennis grade of one is, is similar to the two studies. We didn't see that age and weight and, and the post-op lateral center edge angle was a predictor. We uh, only saw the, uh, the tonus grade uh, important. Of course, the tonus grade is important. I think this is something we know in hip preserving surgery, that if we have a tonus of above one, like two or three, this is a very strong predictor for, for failure. And these are really the cases that we should tell the patient, well, we're sorry, this is too late. And we should not perform open surgery, and especially should not perform hip arthroscopy, even if, it's, if it seems easier. And they push us towards performing surgery. I think there we should be strict and say, no, we know there's very good data that will have a bad result. So in discussion, the uh, predictors for revision was uh, a high post-operative alpha angle did not show as a predictor for re revision surgery. And this is a bit astonishing, and this could completely doesn't fit into the literature. And I was thinking a little bit, why could this be? And that one reason could be, it's just my personal explanation, is that actually the impinging part of, uh, of impinging hip is not at the 12 and not at the 3 o'clock position, but it's somewhere in between. So it depends very much how do we do the, the post-op radiology, how we do the rotation of the leg, because this will depend a lot whether or not we define this as a persisting impingement. And even so, maybe we resected enough here of the impingement, so we gave this hip a good range of motion, but maybe still here, then this would define as a persisting bump. But I think there we need more research to look into what are we looking at these uh, images post-op. Looking at revision rate, uh, there were several factors predicting the revision. It was a high BMI, pincer impingement, and the pre- and post-operative sign of pistol grip deformity, whereas age and treatment of the labrum did not influence the revision rate. Uh, for failure, we had 92% of hip preserved at last follow-up and 95.1 uh, at six years follow-up. We had 78.5 good to excellent clinical results, and the pre-operative turn is uh, above one is a strong predictor for failure. Thank you very much.